one key thing which I thought I should ask you is that there is a growing mismatch of mindset between generations. Growing mismatch. So, and considering that most of the companies are headed by a generation which is, uh, which is you know, not the current generation. So, technically, maybe it's a stereotypical uh, notion, but uh, the that generation does have a my way or the highway attitude. They have that mindset, and we can't deny it. So, do you see any way that we can bridge this? How does this work? Uh, is there some th- change which can happen on this, or is this mindset going to be there? So, uh, I would say that every generation thinks that the previous generation is no good. Hmm. Okay, and if it's two generations, <laughs> about, they think these guys have absolutely no clue. But that's both ways, right? <laughs> it's absolutely so. It's both ways. Yeah. So, if you go back to the 60s, uh, the Levi's generation, yeah. okay, who are now all the baby boomers or whatever you call them, they thought the world was absolute uh, rubbish. Yeah. That's why, you know, Coke said, uh, I'll teach the world how to sing, uh, buy peace, and, you know, people drafted against Vietnam, people did all kinds of things, etc. Because they truly thought that. The old foggies were no good. So every generation thinks that the preceding generation is a bunch of old foggies. Okay, so there's no doubt about that. And this is not going to change. This generation, what's outstanding about them? They're extremely articulate. They're extremely tech savvy. And their ability to take risk is multiple times anybody else. Okay, so that's what defines them. Next, their respect for hierarchy is low. Mm-hmm. Okay, they want their voice to be counted. Yeah. Now, you're making a very important assumption saying that somebody in his 40s or 50s is in the mode of my way or the highway. I can tell you one thing from my experience in India. All these young entrepreneurs you talk about, they are more my way or the highway than any of the other guys. <laughs> okay, what you're saying is completely wrong. All these upstart CEOs of upstart companies, uh-huh. okay, I don't want to name them, they're absolutely terrible. In fact, the kind of stories I hear about some of these guys is just amazing. Uh-huh. Okay, uh-huh. nobody will do it. Which goes back to the values of an organization and the culture in an organization. By and large, multinationals are forced to have a semblance of values and culture. Mm-hmm. By and large, Indian companies and startups start and end with the value, the energy, and the culture set by the owner. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Okay, so there are two two different worlds. Right. Okay, and uh, you can't expect the first world to come into the second, or neither can you expect the second world to walk into the first. But do you think that uh, if people are more emotionally intelligent and aware, there will be a better I would say, say communication or between the cross of uh, the intersectionality of the workplaces. You, do you think there is a space for emotional growth and maturity in the corporate world? Yes. Apart from the, the rules and regulations and the social aspects, personal emotional maturity, where do you see that in today's corporate landscape? Absolutely. In fact, uh, there's enough studies to say that if you look at the future of work and jobs, of the jobs will be much more dominated by soft skills as opposed to hard skills. There is a train of thought today which says hire for soft skill, you can always train the person on hard skills Mm -hmm. as opposed to hire the person for hard skills and let us try and train him on soft skills. Okay, so there's that train of thought already to say hire more for soft skills. When I look at people, I always look at, does the person have the right attitude? Does the person, is the person collaborative? Is the person willing to accept failure the way he or she experienced it through his or her actions? If those are tick in my book, then I think you have the right kind of person to work in your company. Interesting. Interesting. In fact, uh, the whole point of uh, you saying the right person to work in the company now, Our corporate world is made of uh, people who have mostly come out of business schools. So with, uh, you know, the way the world is moving, the way every day changes are happening in the corporate world, I mean, how relevant is the business education today? Like, where does it really... I'll I'll probably add on to this question, Shreya, because, you know, you sit on 
Too many boards. <laughs> finest B school boards in this country. Too many. You know, finest B schools, I would say that. <laughs> and and so you know, you understand what's happening in those B schools today. So the probably uh, are these B education or B school education is going to remain relevant in the future? You know, Hari. Yeah. And and do they also need to bring some immediate changes in the current structure as well? So I think. Uh, Fair question. Uh, it's a fair challenge. Uh, you're right. Currently, I sit on five business school boards. I've done three before this. So I don't think there's any other professional who sat on eight business school boards in this country. Okay. Okay. I keep pushing them to change. Here's my observation for you. Uh, a business school I have the highest respect for is ISB, Indian School of Business. Mm -hmm. Look at what they have done in the last 20 years. I am such have been around for 50 and 60 years, have not been able to do Okay, what ISP has done over the last 20 years. Hats off to them. And one must, you know, appreciate that. Uh, next is, a business school, I think, is going to change fundamentally, in my opinion. There are about 13,000 business schools in the world, of which 6,000 are in India. We graduate close to 6 lakh, 6 lakh MBAs every year. Only 19% of them are employable. 81% are not employable. The average starting salary to fees paid is more than 1.0 in only about 20 schools. Even in many of the IIMs, it is not more than one. So, do we have a problem? Yes, we do have a problem. Do we have a problem of plenty? Yes, we have a problem of plenty. Do we have a problem of quality? The answer is yes. Next, what does a great business school depend on? It depends on outstanding students. Great intake students. It depends on rock star faculty. It depends on the student experience on campus and it depends on the recruiters. These four combine together to give you the ranking or whatever you call, etc. What would I do? And this is what I'm pushing uh, all the B school boards where I am on. What would I do differently? I would move away from subjects to skills. For example, Economics is a subject taught. Hmm. Do you really need to know economics? You learn it on your own. I would rather say, take complex problem solving, creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, communication. Push the skill agenda much more. Because that is what is required in a future world, not a degree. A degree is a collective ensemble of subjects. Whereas a personality is a collective ensemble of skills. I would rather focus on that. And every B school board I am on, I keep pushing this agenda to say, are you looking into the future much better than where you are today? It is a serious question. And I personally believe we need to answer it. Uh, as leaders of industry, as responsible board members in every institution, uh, etc. So, uh, absolutely right. You know, I was talking to a a CEO who, of, a, of a fairly large automobile company. Uh, and, I, and I was asking him that, uh, you know, we are, so we are also trying to create a training program, uh, uh, you know, for the senior leaders. And I said, what are you going to look in that training program if we create something? He said, what is my biggest challenge today? I've got a fantastic leadership team fantastic leadership team who's very, very good in the work that they actually do. But the problem that they actually have is that they're not able to read the future. They're not able to foresee the future. Is there something where, where they can train themselves to start reading the future? And you exactly brought this point that B school, B school needs to look into the future. So unless until they look into the future, how will they train the current people into reading the future? This thing, uh... Very good question. Excellent <laughs> question. You know, data tells us that every industry has, you know, blinkers like a horse when they think about their industry of the future. So if you want to know the future of automobiles, never ask the people in the automobile industry. Ask somebody else. Okay, this is... And the same is true for mobility or the same is true for soft drinks or chips or whatever you call it. Okay. I think the first thing is there are leading edge indicators and lag indicators. Let's take the automobile industry. Since you mentioned automobiles, that's the only reason I'm picking it. The automobile industry has 150 global players. Okay. 
none of them saw EV. Why is that? Even though the first electric car was made in 1956, none of them saw EV. Where is EV coming from? EV is coming from Tesla, which has nothing to do with the old IC engine mobility. EV is coming from BYD. Who is BYD? BYD used to be a battery supplier to Nokia. Suddenly they said, hey, you know what? Battery is the key asset in this new product. I know battery better than any of these other guys. A Ford or a GM or a Volkswagen. And then we just put the cabin together. Let, let's just put a shell around it. You know? Yeah. So, I think one, one thing I'd advocate for all senior leaders, talk to people outside your industry. Okay? Talk to leading edge people. For example, I've said this publicly. You know, today, FMCG is not growing. And they're all saying, the macroeconomic situation is not growing, so we are not growing. Then you're a fax machine. So I fax in the GDP growth and then your growth will come. That is wrong. What are you doing about it? Okay. And I've been advocating, speak to the you know, digital boys. Build partnerships. Okay. That's the only way you'll grow. The more you hang on to your past, the less you'll grow. In fact, there's an interesting study of CEOs done by Forbes, I think. 45% of CEOs last month have said, if we continue with our current thinking and current business models, we will not exist in 10 years' time. The same number last year was 39%. So, CEOs themselves are recognizing that the world is changing very quickly. So, look at who are the industries, where is the consumer changing, why is the consumer changing, okay? And see what parts of that can come to your industry and then evolve around that. Yeah, and, and, you, and you pointed out on... Uh, on relevance of teaching economics in the B school. Uh, on the same relevance aspect, do you think, Shiv, uh, involving the corporate leaders, you know, along with the academicians in a much deeper way, just not one or two guest lectures, but really in a deeper way would be really helpful Absolutely to bring right. our great guys up? Absolutely right. Uh, I sit on the SPJ in board. Mm -hmm. One of my ex-bosses, somebody I have a lot of respect for, Mr. Gopal Krishnan, mm -hmm. who was the resident director and a professor of practice. What he's been able to do for that institution is, he's been able to connect the professors to industry. And they put out something like 20 books, the TCS way, the Mahindra way, the, uh, uh, the bank way, etc. Uh, and enhance the cooperation between industry and uh, uh, academia. I believe more, in, more B schools need to do this professor of practice. Okay, We have to bring much more practical knowledge into uh, the business school. Why is that? Very simply stated. Number one, the number of management trainee programs and the length of the management trainee program is dropping. Nobody has 18 months as a management trainee program anymore. When I started my career, it was an 18-month program. No more today. Today, at best, people have six months. At best, nine months. The employee doesn't want it. The company doesn't want it. Both. Okay? Number one. The variety of MBA programs have changed. Hmm. You have a one-year program, you have a two-year program, you have an online program. Certification. You have a certification program, you have a supply chain MBA, you have a digital MBA, etc. Hmm. Now, one-year programs are hot for anybody with experience. I have two, three years experience. I believe I want to change my stream. I will go and do a one-year program. Two-year program is good for freshers. Okay. So the MBA in the construct and managing the variants and this has to change significantly. That's the other aspect. That requires, you know, significant thinking. The third place where, again, I believe thinking needs to change is, if you look at placement in any business school, it's by and large confined to 75 companies. 75 companies make 300 offers or whatever it is. Those 75 companies typically tend to come from FMCG, banking, consulting, etc. They are not representative of the Indian economy. So if truly a B-School wants to be different and you want to do different things, I would say have a path to 500 companies which represent the Indian economy of the future. And that is how your students will be ready and will be able to contribute to the future. And just to counter that question of yours, Shiv, or reply, is one is student is probably, are they ready for those 500 companies? That is point one because they are also looking for that top 75 companies to be employed with. Number two is, there is so much of focus on the uh, 
uh, on the on the average uh, salaries. Uh, if you look at the newspaper and if you look at all the IMs, uh, they all want to publish that this year the average salary reached here, and that has become the benchmark for True. the success of any B school today. The um, you know the average salary that they're able to get to their students. So it has become a kind of a challenge both with the students and the institution to get the top salary, uh, which can only be given by that 75 companies in those 500 companies. And that's becoming a very challenging aspect. So uh, you're absolutely right. And it's a fair challenge. And I accept the challenge to say that's correct. Everybody wants a salary which is higher than the average so that it's bragging value on LinkedIn, it's bragging value in the family, whatever it is. And that's fair. That's the emotion that uh, one is dealing with. I think when I said 500 companies, the new companies which come in are not going to pay you, you know, uh, anything that's less. Honest, Absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, they are also, they will also regard talent and they will regard remuneration in light with that talent. The point I'm making was, as you become more representative of the economy, hmm. you get more influence and your students and your alumni have much better clout in the long term and your institute will actually gain. If you look at you know, early B schools, etc., early business schools, a lot of the people were absorbed by the public sector. You know, even today, a number of people finish an MBA and then go and do an IS or an IPS. So there are different reasons why people you know, do different things. So, but 56% of the students join an MBA course for money. You can't run away from it. But over a period of time, I personally believe, if you're satisfying the industry requirement of high quality talent, the competitive nature of salary will only increase.